All right, let's get started. So if more people roll in, that's okay too. All right, so welcome everybody to the fourth and final session of OpenCV 101, a practical guide to the Open Computer Vision Library. I'm Matt Reaver. Uh, my email address is there if you have any questions afterwards. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging our sponsors once again, the LLNL Engineering Directorate, the Center for Advanced Signal and Imaging Sciences, also known as CASIS, and the Oakland East Bay chapter of the IEEE Signal Processing Society. So I put up uh, some new files, so uh, make sure that you get session four, the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that's what we're going to be running today. And as well, in the data folder, there's a new file called me.mp4. So uh, we're going to be doing uh, one or two examples with that. So yeah, today should be uh, an exciting session. Uh, we're going to show uh, how to work with video, just uh, basics of it, getting it in, getting it out, as well as doing some processing, as well as uh, doing just kind of a cursory view of uh, some of the more advanced algorithms that can be used for image tracking, as well as background subtraction. So pretty useful stuff there, and we'll be uh, touching on, you know, Superficial level, of course, because this is a very deep topic, but we're going to be learning a little bit of machine learning and uh, seeing a few fun examples of that. So, let's get started. Going back to notebook mode. All right, so working with video. Uh, first thing I'm going to show you is how to play local videos from within the notebook. So, of course, the first thing we're going to do is uh, use our utility commands. Uh, this time we're going to use PyLab inline, which uh, just does simpler uh, graphs. And uh, we're going to need uh, ipython.display uh, clear output, which is going to be uh, needed for displaying stuff within our notebook. And, of course, the directory line, you change this as appropriate for uh, your own system. All right, so first we create this uh, utility function called play video. Uh, you know, you can understand it line by line if you want, but uh, it's pretty straightforward. So, I mean, the most important thing here is we're going to create this object, and this is an example of object-oriented programming here, and if you don't know what that is, that's okay. But uh, video captures and OpenCV work as objects with, you know, its own data and its own functions built into it. So we create this video capture object called vid, and we're going to pass it in uh, the video name. So the user's going to pass in the file name, uh, either uh, local or you know, pass in the full path. We're going to open that. And uh, in case you're curious, if you want to draw from a webcam, uh, you just put in the number zero there for vid name, and that will grab it. And I, yeah, question? Yeah, I played with that a little bit. And just putting a zero in there could get into trouble because you may have other video drivers installed. And so I found I had to explore one and two in order to find my laptop good cap. Uh, yeah, that is a good point. So um, yes, that is true that it's not necessarily zero on your system. Usually zero points to the first one, but yes, that is true. If you have other video devices, it may be one or two. Uh, there are ways of figuring out what that is, but usually it's zero. And uh, we're not going to do that today because it is my understanding on open campus that we're not allowed to use personal cameras. So even though there are some fun examples with that, and I do invite you to play with uh, the, in the examples that are included in the OpenCV uh, GitHub repository. But for now, I'm just going to use uh, pre-recorded examples. So all it does is, uh, you know, you create your object and then you're going to go through an indefinite while loop. You're going to read from your video just using uh, vid.read, your video capture.read function. Make sure that you are actually returning something. And then if so, uh, you know, we're going to convert from BGR to RGB because, uh, you know, OpenCV has that conventional, a little bit oddball BGR format. We need RGB. And then... Uh, this line, I'm going to explain it a bit. This is going to allow us to insert our own code into it, and then we're going to uh, display. So let's execute that. That in and of itself doesn't do anything, but that just defines our function. So in this next cell, we're going to play a video. So the OpenCV repository comes with uh, Megamind uh, clips for some reason. So let's do that. 
So this plays a little bit slowly. This is just kind of an artifact of the notebook. It's a little uh, slow to respond, but uh, it is still a handy utility feature for uh, doing stuff in line. We're gonna see an example in a second on how to play in an external window. So we're going to have to sit through a couple seconds of this because I didn't actually put in anything for uh, doing a keyboard interrupt. So anybody actually see this movie? All right, we got two people who have seen it. Uh, it was all right. Yeah. Uh, keep on waiting, keep on waiting. Well, I guess, I guess this was a DreamWorks movie. I guess they were nice enough to uh, allow some of their clips to be used for uh, educational purposes. So, okay, so let's say we want to play it in an external window, and let's say we don't want to watch it as slowly as that. So apologies once again to, uh, you know, uh, any Mac user who had problems playing uh, back windows, uh, displaying images in an external window. Uh, hopefully this will work for you. If not, um, I'll try to figure something out. So it's the same thing, except we're going to use OpenCV's built-in functions. And then... Let's execute this, and this will play it at warp speed. You can slow that down here. Uh, if you do cv2.wait key, this one here tells it one to wait one millisecond. We can put that like 30, so wait for 30 milliseconds, which is a typical uh, delay between frames. But for right now, we just want to play it as fast as possible. So, okay, let's do some fun stuff. So we can see here in this loop, you know, we're calling frame equals our processing frame. So one of the simplest things you can do with video is just do image processing on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So we're going to override this function, our processing, and we're going to do something simple. Remember the Gaussian blur from uh, I think the first and second sessions. So we're just going to make a nice blurry version of that same thing. You notice that it runs a little more slowly. That's not because of the delay. That's just because it takes time to do that on a frame-by-frame -frame basis. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend uh, playing with this. You know, define your own uh, processing function and use some of the techniques that we learned for image processing from the previous sessions and uh, see what you can do with that. Of course, uh, you're going to want to save videos at some point. So OpenCV provides a simple method for doing it. It's actually very similar to the read method, but instead of uh, video capture, uh, you create something called video writer. And uh, there are a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a whole bunch of options for this, depending on the video format you want. Uh, you know, how the color display works, so we're using something called 4CC. Uh, we give it the frame rate, we give the resolution, which I hard-coded here, uh, but generally you should check it and set it accordingly, but just wanted to make this uh, nice and simple. Uh, but yeah, a whole lot of options, a whole lot of encoding options, you know, there's MP4, AVI, H.264, 265, you know, uh, OpenCV has a, what's known as FFmpeg uh, included with it, so uh, you can do pretty much uh, whatever you want with it. So very simple, you know, we call the read function, and then as long as we keep uh, having frames, we keep going, we call our processing, and then we write to our output object uh, that process frame, and then we remember to release at the end of it. So run this. This doesn't display anything, so this is gonna take a couple seconds to go through our video. Now that's done. Now we're going to play back the processed output, and our processing is just the simple Gaussian filter that we saw before. So we do that. Now we have our processed video saved to disk, and we can play that back or uh, send it to other people, whatever you want to do with that. So any questions there? Well, what's the way to slow the frames down again? The way to slow down the frames in the playback is on this line right here. Yeah, this uh, delay right here, you can modify your own notebook, milliseconds, cv2.wait key, and then delay in milliseconds. So zero is indefinite, waits for user input, one or more will delay it. Uh, 
All right, so moving on, video analysis and object tracking. So uh, two, I guess, they're very related algorithms that are used for uh, object tracking are the mean shift and cam shift algorithms. And um, the OpenCV documentation has a good description of how they work. Uh, just very high level, you know, what you do is you give it a seed, you give it a starting point, like on your first frame of what you want to track. Then it's going to look in that region and evaluate the histogram, uh, preferably in HSV space. And then on a frame by frame basis, it's just going to look for regions that uh, kind of match that histogram. It's going to look for something similar. So we're going to see here. What does that do? Does it do a correlation uh, between the two frames? Uh, it's not a correlation per se. It's different from, you know, like the template matching that we were doing before. Right. Because it's just based on a distribution rather than like an, uh, rather than like a pixel by pixel line out. So your image could deform somewhat and, you know, it would still track it reasonably well. Does that make sense? So uh, it's not perfect by any means. Let's just watch this first. So this video created of myself. So just tracking my hand here. And so I gave it uh, you know, a seed, like I uh, created a bounding box around my hand to begin with, just so it knows what to track. But uh, the code here, uh, not super long, but uh, you know, the gist of it is you create your video capture object, read the first frame, then we're going to define, actually I should have deleted that line. We're going to define a region of interest. So I just picked that out by inspecting the image and you know, drawing a rectangle around my own hand. And then we're going to extract the region of interest. That's what ROI stands for. And we want to work in HSV space because when you do histograms with color images, RGB just isn't practical. You want to break it up into the hue, the saturation, and the value. Um, I do recommend uh, uh, studying up on histogram back projection, which is uh, kind of what this is based on. Uh, a bit of theory there, but uh, I would say it's worth learning if you're going to do color-based object tracking. And, um, yeah, so we're going to uh, compute the histogram within that region and do some normalization. And then uh, the key function here is uh, this CV2.calc back project. Um, Actually, sorry, two, func two key functions, cv2.calc uh, back project and cv2.cam shift. Um, I should mention, uh, yeah, I said mean shift and cam shift. So what I described before was the mean shift algorithm. The cam shift algorithm is simply an ad adaptation of that where it kind of makes it invariant to size. So the mean shift algorithm by itself is going to be sensitive. Like if I moved my hand back, for example, the mean shift algorithm would have a hard time with that. Whereas cam shift will actually normalize to a region and uh, allow you to track uh, objects of different scale or the same object further or closer to the camera. So uh, we compute the histogram back projection here and then we're going to uh, feed that into the cam shift where, which handles uh, the nitty gritty of the algorithm and then draw the points here and do that on a frame by frame basis. So again, um, yeah, don't expect you to understand every single line of this. You know, I definitely uh, you know, invite you to study this offline and definitely you, know, you want to play with this, try your own stuff. You know, just warn you, it's not going to be perfect. Like a lot of things can upset it. But uh, you know, the gist of it is it's tracking things based on uh, the pixel value, the color and the intensity. But uh, this is general purpose. It can work with a lot of things, just uh, with caveats that you know there are multiple things that can cause it to start spuriously tracking something else in uh, your video. So optical flow, optical flow. Uh, the gist of it is, it's a, it's an algorithm for tracking movement within. Uh, within video, so it locks onto some feature. Could be based on, uh, could be based on like a feature detectors like we had before. Could be based on uh, like the histogram distribution or so forth. And the optical flow will just tell you how much, uh, you know, that object in uh, moved from frame to frame. 
So it has a lot of applications. For example, the image compression algorithms like H.264, you watch compressed video. I mean, you probably use this without even realizing it, like just if you watch YouTube. You know, the compression algorithms are often based on computing the difference from frame to frame. So it has a keyframe, and then it'll track motion, and then rather than storing every frame individually, it will actually just keep track of the motion, which allows you to compress it and you know, severely reduce the amount of information in a video while still preserving quality. Um, also, again, it allows you to track objects because if you follow the flow of something, you can uh, see where it's going from frame to frame. So uh, here we're going to use, remember the Shi Tomasi features, which in OpenCV are called uh, good features to track. And just going to do some corner detection here and then call this uh, calc optical flow pyramid. The LK stands for Lucas Kincaid, which is a common algorithm. So we just uh, pass it the features from frame to frame and see where everything's going and then display it. So let's do this. Let's find this example of uh, cars moving. So it's going to pick some features to lock onto. And then it's, uh, we're going to see color traces, kind of streams of where uh, these features are from frame to frame. So let's watch this. You can play with the features here, so if you want to lock on to more stuff. And so if it didn't pick up on the motorcycle that came in, is that because it's not looking for new features as it goes on? Um, in this example, that's right, it is not looking for uh, new features because we called this at the beginning. Also, it has to find some features uh, to begin with, so, uh, you know, using corner detectors may or may not be good for your video, so you can play with that. But to answer your question, yes, that is right. Um, is that one in the, uh, in the repository? That one is not in the repository. I forgot to do that. Let me do that really quickly. No, it should be there. Carc.mp4. Yeah. Sorry about that. So any questions on that? All right. So next topic is background subtraction. So background subtraction, let's say you have a camera that's in a fixed position against you know, relatively static background and you have a whole bunch of moving objects. You know, oftentimes you want to figure out which of these things are moving and what's part of the background just based on that motion. So uh, you can see here that uh, this is just a few lines of code. So uh, key lines here are the foreground background equals cv2.create background subtractor. Uh, MOG stands for mixture of Gaussians, it's just a fancy statistical technique. But uh, what we do is just apply this on a frame by frame basis and um, it's going to see what's moving and what's not. Let's show the example. So this is what the video looks like unprocessed. Uh, just this is a static image here and we see, oops, see the process video with the people moving. So, you know, the stuff that's in the background is considered, it's uh, labeled as black here. And anything that's moving is uh, marked here as white or as gray. So you can kind of see here that uh, just with a little bit of code, you can actually do a pretty robust background subtraction. And then this uh, morphology filter, this open filter, saw before is a good way of, it just kind of eliminates background noise and makes sure that things that aren't supposed to be connected aren't connected. It's going through this a little fast. Anybody have any questions on that? So are there any algorithms that perform a little bit better so you can tell whenever something 
the people stood still, it essentially uh, it's stopped identifying them as having them moving objects and they would fade to black. Yeah, that's a good question. It's going to depend on how long people are standing still or not, whether it's identified as the background. I mean, of course, if somebody's perfectly still throughout the whole thing, it's going to you know, mark them as background. But uh, generally, uh, it will compare it to like all the frames before. So we have this object, uh, create background subtractor, and then you run it on a frame by frame basis. So it's going to compare it based on the current frame and the frames uh, before it. So if somebody stops, it would uh, still identify them as uh, foreground for a while because, uh, you know, for the most part anyway, you know, provided they haven't stopped and stayed perfectly still for too long, it will uh, mark them as foreground. Uh, at what point exactly it marks them as background? Uh, that one's a little complicated. I couldn't tell you exactly what the criteria is. watch the motion and find and lock on and track until gone? Could the optical flow find and uh, track the motion? Yes, it could. Uh, you need to make sure that you're using appropriate features. You know, you're tracking appropriate things in what that. about features that come and go? If it just loses a feature... Oh, that's going to cause a problem. For features that come and go, I mean, optical flow, it's not... Yeah, I mean, it's not super smart, you know. So the feature disappears and reappears and so forth, you're going to see some funky stuff. So yeah, there is, a, there is an example of uh, optical flow that I recommend uh, in the, in the uh, Python folder. Um, I think by default it calls the webcam. Uh, I haven't tried this. But uh, yeah, I do recommend trying that. Just uh, don't use your webcam, at least not here. So uh, Kalman filtering, we're just going to touch on this a little bit. Uh, you know, there's a deep theory here. What it is is it's an estimator of, uh, generally it's the estimator of a state of a system. But for example, in computer vision for video analysis, uh, the state that you want to estimate is the position of an object. So uh, just in general, like an application of a Kalman filter would be, say you have a GPS and you have, you know, which is not a perfect measurement. It's got some noise. You know, somebody's in a car, it's measuring, and then it's going to jump around somewhat. And uh, the Kalman filter is going to kind of smooth that, you know, based on knowledge that, you know, you're not going to have like abrupt changes in velocity. So you know something physically about the underlying system. And the Kalman filter is going to provide uh, a better estimate of uh, where exactly your object is than just the raw, uh, the noisy measurements. So here I'm just showing the built-in example where you see uh, the red line here indicates the, devi the deviation from where the object actually is as well as the measurement which has some noise. And the yellow line is the Kalman filter estimate. It's the deviation from where the object actually is and uh, the Kalman filter. So you can see that the yellow line is, uh, you know, uh, substantially smaller than the red line, which indicates that uh, this is getting us a lot closer to where the object is than if we just use the raw noise. So again, a lot of theory here, and I do recommend reading up on it, but um, I just want to, uh, to create awareness of this. So if you have an application where you have like noisy tracking, uh, Kalman filter is one way of uh, significantly reducing that noise. All right, so on to machine learning. So um, I highly recommend uh, if you want to learn more about machine learning, uh, there's a free online Coursera course, which uh, you, know, you can take at your leisure. Once again, I do definitely recommend uh, Professor Ng's course. Um, so uh, he gave uh, some uh, general ideas of what supervised and unsupervised learning are. So in the context of computer vision, you know, what can we do with these? So for supervised learning, uh, probably the most common application in computer vision would be object identification. You know, you have a picture of something, what is it? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Is it a car? Is it a train? And so forth. So uh, it is actually possible to uh, use uh, training examples. You can actually uh, build a classifier that will tell you what that is. And uh, this is an area of very active research. and. Uh, 
a uh, little bit of a spoiler, I'm just going to tell you that uh, deep learning is kind of like uh, you know the highest performer right now, but uh, that's a bit complicated and beyond the scope of this course and uh, requires, yeah, just a lot of computational power. But, uh, you know, we'll do something simpler on a simpler, you know, simpler example, something a little more tractable. So, um, you know, Ng mentioned uh, the concept of uh, support vector machines. And uh, support vector machines are not, maybe, not as powerful as uh, deep neural networks, but they are still powerful and are, uh, you know, one of the best algorithms for, you know, just out-of-the-box solutions for a lot of different tasks. So, um, you know, s what we're going to do is we're going to take a set of training data and then uh, try to find uh, criteria for separation based on that data, based on the numerical data. So here, for example, this is a basic uh, linear support vector machine where we're trying to find uh, the hyperplane, what they call the one that gives uh, the maximum margin between, uh, you know, your different classes of data, which are previously organized. And uh, there are more advanced kinds of support vector machines that are not necessarily linear. And as you said, it can work with an unlimited number of dimensions. But uh, so we're going to go through, uh, this is a modified example of uh, what's in your Python, the OpenCV uh, samples repository, where we're going to process uh, the digits image here. So what we have here is an image that has uh, handwritten digits, you know, zero through nine. And uh, yeah, I think we're done with that. Zero through nine, and they all have a label. So, you know, some different people wrote them down and somebody, you know, went through the tedious process of actually labeling what's what. So we're going to use that as our basis for training. But um, there is a little bit of pre-processing. You know, generally speaking, you don't want to feed in the raw image into your support vector machine algorithm because one, it's computationally inefficient, and two, uh, it actually has spurious information, also known as noise, which can actually reduce the efficacy of your training. So, uh, yeah, not practical to go through every single line of code here. Uh, yeah, I do recommend going through it uh, later, but uh, hopefully you could take this code and conceivably adapt it towards your, uh, to your own uh, applications. So this is the start of the main part of the script. So uh, this is just telling it that within the giant image, the one that contains the entire, uh, the entire set of digits, uh, each digit is of size 20 by 20. And there are uh, 10 classes, 0 through 9, and this is pointing to where the file is. So this code right here is just reading that in and splitting it up based on, uh, based on the size that we gave it here. And uh, for good training, we want to just randomize it. We want to shuffle the digits around so they're not all in uh, the same order. And so uh, this line right here, uh, the process hog is... Uh, little bit of a black box. It just does some processing based on the edges, gets rid of extraneous information. Uh, you can try what happens uh, if you don't do that pre-processing and uh, short end of it is it doesn't get very uh, good results. So getting to the heart of the code, um, so we do the pre-processing, uh, you know, we assign the labels to it. So uh, model equals SVM goes up here. We're going to, where is that? Class SVM. So we're going to call uh, OpenCV's machine learning uh, support vector machine create. Uh, if you're using an older version of uh, OpenCV, it will just be CV2.SVM. But uh, for version three, it's in uh, ML. So if your code's not running, uh, do check that. So, um, yeah, a lot of different options here. Um, I'm just telling you what uh, you know, some of the important ones are. Like this right here, like, you know, in the figure we showed a linear classifier. Here we're using what's known as a radial basis function. It's what RBF stands for, which is a very general purpose, nonlinear way of doing a data separation. So in any case, so uh, this defines our model, and then this model.train is what's actually going to uh, you know, fit all the parameters of our support vector machine into it. 
And uh, yeah, one thing I want to mention is since we have a limited data set here, we're not going to train against every single piece of data that we have because we want to just validate it. So we train against a subset of our data, uh, some samples, and then we're going to see how well it worked. Now, this is called a cross-validation and is a pretty important to, uh, aspect of uh, supervised machine learning. So we define our model, we train it, and then uh, this right here is uh, just going to do the visualization so we can see how well did this work. So um, this is the input, this is the output. So uh, for this um, evaluation data, what this shows right here is uh, for all the white ones, this is the one that's the one, those are the ones that it identified correctly. These red ones right here are what it misidentified. So you can see that it actually did a pretty good job, and you can see here that uh, you know, it had an error rate of 1.8%, so you know, 98% success rate. Not perfect, but I mean, that's still really good. I mean, even a human might get some of them wrong. And this confusion matrix, what this is, is it tells you for each class, uh, you know, did it get it right or wrong, and what actually did it classify as. So like these diagonal elements here, these are good. You want these to be high. And you know that tells you that like okay we expected a zero we got a zero we expected a one we got a one in some cases here like okay we expected a one and you know we got a nine instead we expected a two and we got a seven so forth that's what the confusion matrix tells you so uh, realize that's kind of a whirlwind tour of it um, so again uh, if you want to learn more about that I do recommend uh, Ing's class on that which actually goes into more detail on how support vector machines work. Although uh, really um, what's most important as a practitioner is that you just understand how to use it rather than the inner workings. And although this code does look like a lot, um, you know, OpenCV is in fact doing a lot of the work for you here. Everybody's quiet again. Are there any questions on that? I understand your question. So does it train on each individual digit? So what it's doing is it is, you have a set of data, so label data. So I have an example of a handwritten digit that's a zero and so forth. We're taking a subset of that data. And then the model, what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to feed in, uh, you know, it could be the data that we trained on or it could be brand new data that's of the same format and it's going to output uh, the prediction based on uh, the model. So the support vector machine is kind of a general model with some free parameters, and it's going to set those parameters based on uh, your training. You know, it's going to try to minimize what's called the cost function and uh, make it so that it minimizes the error on your training data. So the output is, yeah, just a classifier. So um, yeah, one exercise you could do on this is just uh, create your own data you know, make it in like that 20 by 20 format and then feed it through uh, your uh, model here. Yeah, this goes, this calls the evaluate model function right here. And uh, yeah, what you do is you call this model.predict and then you can pass in your own data here and it's going to uh, try to tell what exactly you have here. So I realize, yeah, that's that's a lot to take in all at once. You know, only so much we can cover here. But hopefully, you know, you can uh, look at this, and you know, if you have a, a similar problem where uh, you want to classify your images, you know, within reason, um, you know, hopefully you can adapt uh, this to that. All right. So going into uh, unsupervised machine learning, you know. We're talking about clustering here where, you know, we don't know ahead of time what exactly the data is, what exactly our clusters are. But, you know, oftentimes data, you know, if you plot it on you know, two or three dimensions or arbitrary number of dimensions, um, you know, oftentimes things just tend to be tightly spaced. So based on that spacing, 
we can assign labels to it. And um, you know, a well-known algorithm of that is known as k-means clustering. Um, just superficial overview of how the algorithm works. It kind of starts off with either predefined uh, cluster centers, you know, or you can randomize it so it might select like one point here, one point here, and one point here. Then it will group all of you know each point by how far away it is by some metric like the Euclidean metric, assign it to a cluster, and then um, could stop there, but that's probably not very good because odds are uh, your cluster points, you know, if they're randomly chosen, they're not going to be uh, what you want. But then you're going to take the centroid points for every all the points that were assigned to that cluster, you compute the centroid of that, and then that's going to be your new cluster point, and then you iterate of that algorithm over and over again. And then it doesn't always work, depends on your data, but uh, when things go well, you know, you'll find a centroid point that fits nicely, that uh, does good separation of your data, and uh, you get a nice clean uh, clustering. So, okay, what's an application of that in like image processing computer vision? So uh, this is a nice fun example. We're going to do a color clustering on an image. So, you know, we start with an image that's, you know, your 8-bit channels of red, green, and blue. We want to reduce it to, you know, uh, eight levels. You know, so we're going to make everything just, uh, I guess it would be a 3-bit image with only eight possible values. So we're going to take our image. Uh, you have a home.jpg in your directory. Then we're just going to create it into an array. So you're going to have like however many thousand points for your pixels and then uh, three across for your R, G, and B channels. And uh, we're going to take each one of those points and we're going to create clusters of colors. So we're going to use our uh, CV2.k means there. And what it's going to do is cluster those colors into only eight values. So we can see here, actually let's show them before. Actually, okay, so we can see here the original image and I included this here for different levels of uh, clustering. This is just a web image. This is the actual output of the code here. So we can see 8-bit uh, uh, bit clustering. So we're finding the eight best colors and just assigning everything to a label to that. So, um, I don't know, this to me kind of looks like a 1990-era like PC game image. But uh, you can just see the reduced color map, but it shows the best colors to do that reduction. So, um, yeah, you should definitely look up to see what exactly these parameters are, you know, the criteria for clustering and uh, what these numbers do. You get uh, slightly different answers, but for this example, just the, these parameters do a good job. And uh, like I said before, like talking about how you seed it, um, here we just chose uh, random centers for the initialization. Any questions on that? Uh, yeah, I do recommend running that example uh, offline. So, it's about the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, what's known as the Har Cascade. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, supervised learning again, where you feed it um, examples of something you want to detect. So, in this case, a face. So, one of the best known examples and something that it works well for. And uh, what Har Cascade is, you know, it's kind of a binary feature where you have things that are on or off. So it's looking for, you know, like a human face has eyes and a mouth and so forth. So it's going to look for something where, you know, there are features like um, in a well-defined, uh, <clears throat> well-defined relative location. So you have like two eyes, a mouth, you know, a head that's against some sort of background, and it's going to do some sweeping match of that. So. Um, What's nice here is that uh, you know we have some built-in uh, cascade classifiers that were pre-trained, and you know you can see here just how uh, easy it is to use. And uh, incidentally, um, just doing a fun example here, uh, this code right here shows you how to get an image from the web. So, you know, in case you're uh, not tired of uh, looking at my face, you know, I pulled an image of my face from the Cases website. So we're going to uh, this block here just does that. You can't get to it? Are you on? The HTTPS probably stopped us from 
outside the lab getting in. Really? I got it. Yeah, you should be able to get it because the CASIS website is uh, both internal and external. Let me see, can I? Yeah, I just ran it. It did work for me. What error are you getting? Um, attribute error. You have to read module object has no attribute request. What version of Python are you using? Okay, well, we'll talk about that offline. Um, just this URL lib. Uh, yeah, the URL lib, it may be a, there, there are version differences. So let's just leave it at that. But if you're using Python 3, this will work. But uh, in any case, I do recommend, uh, you know, this is um, actually fairly robust. So I do recommend finding another image and trying it on that. So, okay, so uh, the Har Cascade works on grayscale images, and then just to detect a face, it's just this nice simple function right here. Faces equals face cascade dot detect multi scale, uh, where face cascade was uh, defined here, loading this data, which you should have. And uh, this right here detects the, this sets the region of scales. Um, you know, how small and how big do you want the face? So, um, Set this as appropriate for your application. Uh, setting the range wider may get spurious results, and but setting it narrower may miss actual things. And then uh, on top of the face cascade, we're going to do uh, the eye cascade. So uh, we call, you know, we iterate over the faces and then draw a rectangle. And then within the face, we do an eye cascade and then draw a rectangle on that. So this was just done using my own face, but. Uh, yeah, this one I found to be, you know, surprisingly robust. Like this will actually do a good job. So, um, yeah, try it on your own images. Uh, why is this so big? Yeah. So um, this is an example below where you have uh, two kids' faces. It works uh, just the same. So uh, pretty simple, and uh, in the data directory, you should have a bunch of different cascades for like detecting people, for detecting upper halves of uh, torsos, and so forth, uh, and from different angles. So, uh, you know, pretty straightforward to use. Um, I definitely recommend playing with this for uh, a variety of different images. And uh, on top of that, um, I'm recommending these exercises here. Since we learned how to do video processing, you know, you should be able to, you should have the knowledge at this point to adapt the code above to work with a video and actually see a real time face tracking. And again, um, yeah, try some of the other examples on cascades on images and videos uh, that you might have. So it's the last part that I have. Uh, we, yeah, question. So there's, so there's no knowledge in this algorithm about what describes what I'm not sure I understand your question. Like it doesn't. Like it doesn't know that in, like an eye is kind of like a thin oblong shape or something, or a face should be maybe like an ellipsoid or something like that with some hair. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't actually have any knowledge ahead of time about um, what these. So the question is, uh, does the Har Cascade have any advanced knowledge on uh, what exactly you're looking for? So um, try to answer your question. It's the Har Cascade is a little bit crude. It's not like, uh, you know, it's not at the same level as a human. It's just looking for some sort of contrast here, like around the eyes. Like, okay, a face would have like some sort of, yeah, oblong shape against the background. Then the eyes would have some contrast here. You know, you'd have like eyes, a nose, and a mouth. So it's just looking for some general contrast against that. So you could feed it something that's not a face that, you know, just kind of has a similar feature here. And yes, that will fool the cascade. So you could, in fact, get spurious results uh, using this method. Because, yeah, it's, it's not super sophisticated. It's not sophisticated as your mind or your eye, you know. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so the Har Cascade is, uh, it is an example of a trained algorithm. So uh, the training process is a bit involved. I got here a 20 minute video on how to do that. We've got about 15 minutes left of class. So uh, 
It's up to you guys. Do you guys want to watch this? I'm seeing a bunch of blank stares. Okay, I'll let you guys watch this in your own time then. So uh, are there any more questions on anything, uh, any of the sessions? Was this useful to you guys? Okay, I'm seeing not, so that makes me happy. All right, well, I'll hang around here for another 15 minutes. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, please ask. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And that concludes the OpenCV short course.